Today's episode of Entertainment Drive Through is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com has over 180,000 audiobooks and audio products. Get your free audiobook of your choice at audibletrial.com slash eDriveThru. Welcome to Entertainment Drive Through. Today's special is Roger O'Donnell, your position. Show me just uh, 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 Quiet on the set. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Hello, hello, welcome to Entertainment Drive Through. I'm Anna, with me is my co host Dan. And today we have an amazing keyboardist. He's a producer, composer. He's played for the likes of The Psychedelic First, Thompson Twins, Berlin, and most of all, The Cure. He's had an amazing, successful solo career, and now he just released Love and Other Tragedies with Julia Kent, but he'll tell you more about that. Let's welcome, joining us, is the one, the only, Roger O'Donnell. Yeah, Woo! welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello, thanks. <laughs> How's it going? Good, pretty good. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, tell us a bit about yourself, because this is a, a quite a hell of a career you've had so far. How did you get started as a musician? Um, <clears throat> that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> so I was born at home next to the piano, mm-hmm. and uh, I guess I like to say I've never really moved that far away from one. So I played it from when I was a child, and uh, and then I gradually, as I got into uh, my teens, um, I started playing with local bands, and then it just kind of developed. And then I, it never really seemed like a viable career choice to me. So I went to art school, which is like what, which is what most English musicians do, mm-hmm. or they do these days. Uh, kind of. Um, you know, like an excuse I'm not going to work. So I did that and then I joined a band and then I kind of just, it just fell into place from there. Right, nice. right. And, you know, I mean, you talk about how you got into it, but when is that exact moment that you realized that being a musician is what you were meant to do? You know, it wasn't going to be running an Irish pub called O'Donnell's. <laughs> you wanted to be a musician. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of other bars in New York. That's <laughs> <laughs> covered. Um, I don't know. I don't think it was one, like, wake-up kind of moment. It wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, a eureka moment. It was just, uh, I think it was um, a gradual understanding of of, of it was something that I could do. Mm -hmm. And that it was, uh, you know, it was an an option. Because at first I I didn't really think it was an option. But Mm -hmm. then it gradually kind of became clear and I realized that I could make money doing it and that I could earn a living. Uh, I mean, it took a while mm-hmm. um, in the early days. It was very difficult, and I didn't make much money for a long time. And right. it was, it was, it ended up being a hard career choice um, because most of my friends were very successful and uh, artists and designers and whatever. And I was struggling as a musician, but mm-hmm. eventually it paid off. Yeah, nice. although that was never that was never the aim. It was never, I just did it because I loved doing it. So right. But now you've been done both solo and band. Do you, is there one you prefer, or is it just different experience? Uh, yeah, it's a completely different experience. It's nice to have uh, uh, total creative control when you work on your own. Right. But it's also really, really nice to work in a band and uh, to and you know you build up a relationship mm-hmm. uh, with musicians and and they become friends or they're more like family. So. Right. Uh, you, uh, it's completely different. Um, and I usually work completely on my own when I'm solo, but this is, uh, this is different, this project that I'm doing now. Right. right. And why the, why the, the col- specific collaboration for this one? I mean, it, it's a really cool project that you've got going on right now, you know, with, with just, you know, you, you know, the piano and the, the stringed instrument, you know, I mean, why yeah. that specific, uh, combination? Uh, I'll probably- yeah, I've always loved the cello, and yeah. uh, one of my best friends in Toronto is a cellist, and we we did we were, I wrote some things to do play with him, and I really like the combination of piano and cello. Um, the cello is the closest instrument to the, the range to the human voice, so it's like, and I've never 
been that great at writing lyrics. (laughs) 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 It's that's the voice, I guess. And uh, for this project, I was introduced to Julia, who's an incredible musician. Oh yeah. uh, Basically, I wrote I wrote the whole thing for her. So wow. The the piano piano is really a secondary instrument in on this record. So it's more uh, you know it's more a vehicle for her um, playing. Right. So it was a good experience working with her. Uh, yeah, well, we've well, <laughs> we only actually met once. We do everything. Really? Using, yeah, we do everything using Dropbox. Uh, <laughs> we send files, uh, you know. But that's the way I work with most people because the, the, most of the people that I work with are, are always busy, and we usually live in di- on different continents. That's so, so crazy <laughs> nowadays that you can do that. Well, and I, I noticed yeah. a, lo- a lot of people are doing that now. And, you know, I wanted to, a- I actually want to ask about this process because I'm really fascinated by this. You know, like I said, a lot of people seem to be doing this now where it's like one person will write, you know, a part of a song and they'll send it off to someone on the other end of the world. And then they'll se- yeah. that person will send back another part and then someone will mix yeah. it together. Do you write all of the music for this or did you write just the piano part and then she sent you back a cello part? Uh, no, I wrote it all. Okay. <laughs> so do you I'm s- a little more controlling than that. Uh, <laughs> so I sent her the, I sent her the charts, mm-hmm. uh, the score, and she, she played it pretty much. I think she maybe changed two notes. Wow. Like, Interesting. So, and left out a few that were, were uh, I mean, it, it's difficult to think I'm a keyboard player, and I know the range of instruments, mm-hmm. but sometimes what I write is a little tricky. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, I think she left out two or three notes that were just ridiculous to play. But, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I guess I kind of started with uh, Jimmy Camborello with the Postal Service. I mean, the, even the, the band name is named after the way they worked, because mm-hmm. he would write his parts and then send them to... Uh, I can't remember. I don't remember that other guy's name from Death Cab. He's cute. Uh, so he would post them up to Portland, and then they would they would do it by the post. You know. Wow. At least now it's a uh, file service, and it makes it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Yeah. Although this was this was not a quick process. It took three years, I think. Wow! Wow! I can imagine though. And do you, do you, yeah. now when you, so when you send them off to her or when you sent them off to her, so you sent her a score or did you have anything recorded that you sent her at all? Uh, she, yeah, she, she doesn't need to use anything recorded. She just looks at the notes and knows what they sound like. Oh. Uh, but I, th- I may have sent her MP3s because I use, I use an orchestral sample library called Vienna Symphony yeah. oh, nice. Library. Uh, which allows you to really vocalize and hear it as it will. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's close, but it's, it's close, but then it's not. It's like a million miles away. When I get the files back from Julia, mm-hmm. it just sounds real and live and amazing. So. That's what Dan says, too, about logic and stuff like that, because he's been using drums and stuff like that, but he's like, no, it's not the same. It's not the same as the real instrument. Well, it's I mean, come it's on. nice to, the way I say it is it's nice to use the samples as, like, scratch tracks. It's nice to use them, like, you know, when you, when you want to make a track for, for your band, they haven't heard the song yet, and you just want to yeah. send them something. I think it's great for that, but, you know, I, yeah. I, just, I just personally feel that when you get a real drum kit or you get a real cello Mm -hmm. or you know a real keyboard on the you know or at least you know I mean with keyboard it's a little different because it's electronic sounds mostly anyway but when you get a real person playing it it just the the feeling is is much more there yeah and that's not a real piano on there by the way (laughs) (laughs) it's it's a it's a it's a um, program called Ivory oh okay and it's the most incredible uh, piano samples you can get. Like. Yeah, it's quite amazing. But how is it for yeah. you? Because now you've played for a while. It must be amazing for you to like see the development of keyboards and synthesizers, and now like the online stuff. Isn't it phenomenal? <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I was thinking. I think I was talking to a, a really old friend of mine that I worked in uh, in the Thompson Twins with, which is. 30, uh, more than 30 years ago and mm-hmm. when we had the first MIDI instrument. Right. And I went up, when I started playing, mm-hmm. there were, you know, there was a choice of two or three electric pianos mm-hmm. and that was it. Crazy. And then, 
uh, since came along and then virtual. And yeah, it's been huge sampling. I remember when that um, originally started, and that was a huge revolution. And now it's everything software based, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing I've noticed, though. like the thing that I've noticed, though, especially about today, though, when it comes to all these options, I, you know, I, I like the fact that there's so many options because the thing I love about music, it's like there's no rules. I mean, there really are no rules. You know, I mean, we get all these different options and it doesn't matter how it sounds. It's it's interesting to know how you can place it with the music. But I feel like a lot of people today rely on the ease of like the easy access to it and they don't focus on the quality of it. You know, and it's, it's, right. really, it, you know, like, like, I think that some of these plugins are really amazing, but at the same time, I do feel like it's taking so, a lot of that human element out of it. And that's, that's something that I think is, is kind of bad about it at the same time. Yeah. I don't use, um, I only use this piano stuff. I don't use any other virtual instruments. Right. I use all, um, I mean, for final recording, I wouldn't use the Vienna Symphony Orchestra. I would always record an orchestra or a string section. I never use virtual synths because I've I've got the best stuff that you can. You know, I just don't need to do that, and and they, it doesn't sound as good. I like the um, virtual and to real, and it's nowhere near it. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break to listen to a clip from Tristan, Tristan and Isolde, by Roger O'Donnell. But we will be right back. You know, another question I wanted to ask you, because you've been around for, you know, a while, you know, I mean, you know, well, I didn't mean to. There's I no way to go around well, the way, saying no, that the politely. Way, the no way, way I wanted to say it, though, was, you know, I mean, because you, you've been around, you know, since before <laughs> and after social media. And I was wondering, you yeah. know, how has that affected how you how you promote the music that you make and the projects that you're working on? I mean, do, are you do you use a lot of social media or do you still tend to to do it, you know, other ways? No, I love social media. I, OK, I've always been I've never been of the school of, uh, you know, uh, locking yourself away in a house. Mm -hmm. a mansion on the top of a hill and not talking to your fans for four years. I've always been um, very open with my creative process. Uh, my first solo album, I there was a floppy disk with mm -hmm. MIDI files on it. Oh, <laughs> so, nice. Um, I, I use mm, Twitter not so much anymore because I, I was going to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> because you're too Facebook. honest or...? I mean, Huh? <laughs> it's because you're too honest. Uh, I feel like you can't say anything anymore. Like the social media is taken yeah. so seriously. It's ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a bit, uh, I say what I think. So <laughs> I stopped, I stopped using that so much. Um, I have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, um, my website has kind of been overlooked, I think, because social media is so much more immediate than a, mm -hmm. than a website. Right. So I, I tend to use that more. Yeah, I love it. I'm, I, you know, I said the other day, I think of my fans as friends, really. I've Aww. become very close with a lot of people. Well, and actually you said something that's very interesting, you know, about the fact that you feel like your website gets overlooked. I've noticed a lot of musicians and, and people in the entertainment industry in general are using social media instead of websites now. Yeah. Well, there's not really... I mean, it's a good place to archive in, in information. Yeah. Absolutely. Not so much for news, because... Uh, uh, social media is so instant and you know if you put something uh, on your website then people maybe go there once a week but if you put it on the unless you've got some kind of I don't know message board or or a newsletter that nobody does that anymore right. that's true but I feel like the website is more for as you say other people who need to reach you like when you go to venues or when you pitch yourself to I feel like people look at that more yeah. and then they look at how many fans you have on Twitter and Facebook because they need to know those things <laughs> because that's apparently yeah. how many people are going to show up to your like gig yeah, which yeah, is got, no you, way yeah if you've got 20,000 followers then all 20,000 <laughs> will show up to every show it's you so do funny. just <laughs> cracks yeah. me up 
Yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, the amount of people that um, sign up for a Facebook um, event, I think you can divide that by 20. And that's right. Roughly <laughs> <good thing. laughs> that is so true. Now, I have a little bit of a question because I was looking over your IMDb thing because I remembered a lot of the songs. I didn't know that you were like the writer of some of the most famous songs of Cure, like the pictures of you and love song and stuff. It must be really nice to see those songs in movies and stuff. Yeah, it's nice. Um, we, uh, the Cure um, publishing is always split equally amongst all, them, all of the members. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, you'll see that everybody's... Um, well, that's at least nice that you get some credit <laughs> for it. The, I, uh, the Guns N' Roses did the same way because uh, they, and I think it was Matt Sorum that said uh, that there's a reason why it's just to keep really everybody in the band because it keeps splitting yeah, up. He, yeah, he said it was to it was to avoid members killing each yeah. other. <laughs> he said he said yeah. basically they they just said. Well, let's put it this way. We're dividing it all equally. But if two people write the song and they're in the room, then they get they get, you know, more of a cut, but everyone gets a cut of the song. Right, yeah. I think well, that's, you know, in a band in general, good. I feel like it, you know, it's it's a good way to go. Well, a lot of band, there are a few bands do that. Yeah. Probably uh, to avoid yeah. conflict. <laughs> <laughs> because money must be such a conflict just in general like I feel like a band it must be like I love being in a band but I hate the whole business side of it <laughs> oh that's why you have a manager yes exactly that's what managers are for I like that that's probably why we ha- <laughs> we need a manager Dan right <laughs> well, I'm, well I'm cu- the thing I'm curious though about these songs and about the new music that you're writing you know and, and all the instrumental stuff I mean do you write you know, music for bands and for your solo projects the same way? Do you start with, a, you know, a specific way for all of it? Or do you, do you ha- re- is it really just different every time? Um, I think the creative process is the same. It, uh, it just depends on how many instruments you've got. With, with a band, right. you've got four or five. And with a uh, chamber orchestra, you've got 24. Mm-hmm. Symphony orchestra, you've got 40 or 50. And not. You know, I'm working on projects with all of those. Um, yeah, there's a lot more you can do with an orchestra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Way but, more. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, you can't get the kind of emotion that you get with a band. Or mm-hmm. that uh, aggression, I think. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you can. Uh, I, I normally start with the piano. I normally work from the piano outwards, uh, which is can be quite a linear way of working Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are anti that I think that want to be more free but that's just the way I work and I'm comfortable with it so okay I am curious because (laughs) we uh, we have a theory so when do you feel you get most inspired Um, like is there a specific like like daytime nighttime or like is it a specific do you have to put yourself in a specific atmosphere or does it just or come every, to you randomly or every year just on like <laughs> July 3rd at 4pm Pacific Standard Time no <laughs> so much in summer because it's too nice out yeah right. so, generally work more in the winter but I used to think that um, the kind of the creative flow was a difficult thing and you had to be in the right place in the right time. But now I can, I know that it's there all the time and I just have to go and turn it on. Oh, so, nice. And uh, what, what do you do to turn it on? Do you like sit yourself just down with a cup of coffee piano. or? No, uh, just go and sit at the piano. Okay. Oh, nice. And, and have, um, well, I need to be, I need to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't just, I need to have a, a goal. So, uh, uh, and this this was it. I write very quickly. I write uh, like very very quickly. So, and, like it was a couple of hours. Do you have Do you have any tricks for for writer's block? I don't have writer's block. You don't get writer's block. That must <laughs> no. be nice. Oh, I I, I wish <laughs> well, I wish uh, none of us got writer's block. <laughs> uh, I I think it's the difference where it's a. If you, if you approach, it's the craft or art approach. If you approach it as an art, okay. then I don't think you get creative block. But I think if you cre- if you approach it as some kind of craft, like you're building a table or something, mm-hmm. then you might then you might run into that. But 
I try not to get into that area. I don't, I'm not even interested in uh, making music as a craft. I'm not really interested in... I just want to uh, be creative and let that flow happen. That's and if it doesn't, you know, then I walk away. That's an interesting way of putting it, you know, I mean, because that is, that is very true. I, you know, and I feel like that, that is one of the reasons why people get so stuck in writer's block is the idea that it's like, all right, now I, you know, I'm building this up from the ground up. I've got this part. Now, how would this other part be perfect for this? And I feel like they're thinking too much into it instead of just letting it go. Too much pressure. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't have to mm-hmm. either. I think that helps. You know, some people have to sit there and bang out a song for, you know, p- writers that write for publishers. Mm-hmm. They, then they have to. That's their job. But I don't have to. I do it uh, as uh, an art form. I, do, I'm, I was just like imagining you were going to say, well, I just wake up one day and I just, you know, I go, oh, I just dreamt of like the greatest song ever. Let's see. How do I play that on the piano? Done. That would be nice. <laughs> no, there's no one like that. Uh, <laughs> well, in, in terms of, you know, everything so far, though, you know, in terms of, you know, your career as a whole, what has been one of the biggest challenges for you and what have you done to overcome it? Mm, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think I've really had any challenges. Well, that's good. I mean, I just do what well, I, I like to be, I like to challenge myself all the time. Mm-hmm. So I never feel comfortable in what I'm doing. So, so you don't guess, feel it um, as a challenge. It's just, you know, this is what you do. You challenge yourself all the time. So it's, it doesn't know there's no particular thing that feels more challenging than the other or. Yeah. I don't want to be comfortable. Oh. I don't want to be comfortable with the music that I make. Uh, that's not a good place to be. Either. I'm impressed then, <laughs> because people tend to get so like standard and like keep it comfortable. So it's, it's really cool to you know. So it's kind of, it's kind of like you're you're laying down uh, like a, a road and you're just constantly putting speed bumps. Nice. Uh, not. I'm just mm, yeah maybe speed bumps but maybe <laughs> taking the turning maybe turning onto a road that I don't know. I mean it's it's not like the it's not like the speed bumps here in Iceland where it's just like a little <laughs> like you know almost triangle but it's like only in like the middle of the road so you have to like move your car so you don't damage the bottom of your car. These are these yeah. are just smooth. They're not really that big of a deal. They just they just they just happen to be there. No, I like to turn off onto a different road and. Uh, yeah. uh, Maybe close my eyes for a bit. I got gotcha. Explore. I like that. No, but which car are you driving though? Because I know you're a car <laughs> fanatic. So, so that's the real question. Yeah, I, I do love cars. <laughs> so, which car but are you, you driving? The, you which car are you driving now these days? Uh, I have three that I drive. Oh, um, nice. Uh, two Ferraris and a Porsche. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, nineteen seventy-three Dino. Uh, Ferrari, uh, 2014 uh, 458 Speciali, mm. and the car I drive every day is a Cayenne, so it's just nice. boring. I, well, I still have I still have a picture because uh yeah my my dad when my dad met Roger he had to have a picture of him and his car because his car was so cool <laughs> so that's why I asked I had to too funny I just have that picture still somewhere I have to find it so funny. <laughs> Well, speaking of fun cars and challenges, we actually have a new challenge for you today. Right. Because we are up to our segment, the question of the month. month. Today's episode of Entertainment Drive Thru is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com is offering listeners a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash eDriveThru and choose from over 180,000 audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's just that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash eDriveThru. That's audibletrial.com slash eDriveThru and get started today. So this month's question has been changed a little bit to sound less less uh, depressing. Uh, but this month's question <laughs> is, if you could be the only person on Earth for just one day, what would be the Ooh. first thing you would do? See, I like how he starts it off with, oh. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, 
The only person on earth. That would be boring, wouldn't it? Exactly. Well, I spent, I, that was yeah, my but, thought, too. But it's just for one day. Spent my time alone. So, uh, <laughs> is, is this a choice? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Wouldn't it be better? Uh-huh. Like, what if you had access to everything? Like the 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 good not good thing about being the last man on person. <laughs> I, I, that was really a wrong way of saying it. The uh, most things that I do, I can't do without support. Mm. I mean, okay, what would you do though? Um, if, if you say have like support, gun driver, one on one Ferrari. Well, like so I couldn't do. I'd need like twenty mechanics to get it started, <laughs> or go and fly an airplane, like. A uh, fighter jet. You couldn't do that without that's, help. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking when you when you guys were discussing this because I was like, you can't really go anywhere because you can't go on a plane unless you like, and and then you uh-huh. don't know if you have internet because there's nobody powering those things. So like, you know what I mean? Like all the things that you love it's so true. much are just like not there. Really. See I, see, I feel like the one thing that would be a hell of a lot of fun is taking is getting in a really really nice car and finding like a freeway that just goes straight for like a thousand miles and just going just like speeding it just going as fast as you can down that that'd be that'd be you do that anyway (laughs) you don't need to be the last person you just do that anyway until you see a police officer and then you go well shit well no i don't do it on tracks so okay okay i go on tracks uh uh, and I fly airplanes. I'm a pilot. Nice. So. See, so you're you know uh-huh. you're clever. You do everything anyway that you want to do. Yeah, he doesn't need he doesn't need to yeah. be the only person. He no. does all this stuff yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty lucky position, I guess. That's freaking amazing. No, I love that. No, this is why you get to do the, all all these awesome things because you challenge yourself and you go all these roads that you're you know <laughs> you're not supposed to or yeah. like that. You know, what? what's new? Mm. Well, I guess, though, this question kind of leads me to a new question. So I guess getting back to the interview that now that we've had our fun, but I wanted to ask, you know, because you mentioned that you're a pilot. How did you get into to being a pilot? Uh, I met a girl in Texas once, and uh, she said uh, that she could uh, fly. She learned to fly in high school. I was like, well... That's cool. <laughs> and uh, it never really crossed my mind of learning to fly. I thought, that would be a cool thing to do. So when the tour ended, I um, I found out that there was an airfield close to my house. No way. And, uh, yeah, that was 25 years ago. So I've been flying a long time now. And, do you ever- and it's very relaxing. It's an incredibly relaxing uh, uh, hobby or sport or whatever you right. want to call it. Well, and do you ever use it as a way, as a means of going on tour? Like, do you fly your own planes no. to get there? No, you no. have other people fly you. No, because that's when you get killed. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, too much. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. I- when you do it for um, for transportation, then you take risks because you need to be somewhere at a certain time, and it's that's the true. Worst, right. Mm-hmm. But I, there, there was a period where I wasn't allowed to drink on. In case both the pilots uh, had a heart attack and I had to take over. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! So that's that's the only so that's the only reason you can't drink on a plane is just in case you have to take over for someone. It's not because you shouldn't yeah. fly while drinking. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, no, but I mean when I'm a passenger. Oh, the, okay. When I'm um, I flew a seven thirty seven simulator recently, oh. and it wasn't easy. Oh, Whoa, I bet. I can't imagine. Like, oh, it really that just difficult. seems like such a responsibility to me. This is why I could never fly. I, I don't like responsibility. I think well, I'm that's a kid a, at heart. That's actually something interesting because I, I have friends that are that are pilots as well. And I, I love that at, Like all of us who don't fly planes, we just assume that every plane is the same. <laughs> that it's like cars. You, you just jump in and it's like, all right, I'm good to go. But they're so much different than, than like, each, like each one is so much different than the other. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh... Well, I mean, basically, there's... Uh, well, yeah. Uh, you know, but, the, yeah, there's a lot of, like, uh, complicated stuff. I mean, the flying of it is, is basically... Well, same but I love, process. I love I love this scene in the movie Airplane though, where it's just showing like all the dials and knobs, and it's just going yeah. for like a solid minute, <laughs> going through all of them. Yeah, there's a lot of dials on those planes. 
Well, getting back to a music question, though, you know, I, another thing I wanted to ask, you know, this is another, uh, you know, a career journey question, but what it, along the way has been some of the best advice that maybe someone's given you that, you know, has really stuck with you, you'd advise to people just getting started? Um, Outs- outside of I, make sure someone else flies the plane for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember anybody giving me any advice. I don't remember anybody ever giving me any advice. Oh. What I should have done is told me not to do it. <laughs> and that's why I tell people now. <laughs> but then you would have done it anyway because you wanted to. I think so, right? Yeah, true. But <laughs> even when I started, there was, a, there, was a, there was a chance that you could actually make a living from it. There isn't anymore. No, true. It's, it's impossible. So you better just do it now because you love it and you better, uh, you know, really want to do it. Well, really I, be passionate. Well, yeah. I guess because, because this is kind of the, the direction of the topic, I suppose. Um, what are, you, are your opinions on streaming then? You know, with like Spotify and the now whatever app that whatever the hell Apple's doing. I don't think any of us really know <laughs> what, you know, what are what's your opinion on all of this? Uh, yeah, streaming. Uh, well, unfortunately, the, the model that was set up by Spotify was particularly anti-artist in, yeah. in that they did those deals with the labels, and the labels actually own Spotify, so the labels are making money, but the artist isn't. Right. Um, that's not fair. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you can only hope that Apple would be uh, fairer, um, but we'll, that remains to be seen. I think what they do with iTunes... Uh, with downloading, you know, is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very strong Apple supporter. Uh, I what? don't know. I mean, it's here. It's, I mean, it's not going to go away ever. Right. <laughs> so what I like to say is, rather than trying to put the genie back in the bowl, mm-hmm. you better try and ask the genie what it can do for you. Yeah, you know? that's a good point. What it's done for the music business in general is democratize it and make it uh, less an elite. Um, industry but in you know instead of a few people making a lot of money there's a lot of people making not very much money so right. it's it's very difficult to sustain a career now i think mm-hmm. right well and that's a, that's the thing is you know i mean because like I, I feel like the the nice thing about it is it's it's great for exposure. I, I mean, actually, I was having this discussion with someone recently, and I think it's actually if you really if you really break it down, the people that have already been successful, I feel like it's really great for their exposure. <laughs> but for the people that are just starting out, it's like, well, no one knows who we are anyway, so it's not really doing much for exposure. Yeah, you know. That's true. Well, and, yeah. I th- and I thought it was so funny, like you know, Apple just you know they just recently announced the, this Apple music or whatever it's called. And I'm normally a really huge supporter of Apple myself, but the thing that I found really interesting, and I, I don't know how much of this is true, but I, I, I looked up on it and it looked very, very interesting to me is they were talking about how, you know, the big thing that was wrong with title was the fact that it was just supporting the, the successful artists, but they didn't really include the, the unsigned, you know, starting artists. And so Apple made this mm-hmm. big thing apparently at a meeting how, you know, don't worry, t- you know, to all the, you know, the, the starving musicians, you know, the, the unsigned artists, don't worry, you will definitely be involved in this. And hey, we have one of you with us. And they announced like this unsigned artist. And then they they named this person, but that person turned out to not actually be an artist. And they even like it was like their Twitter uh, profile was created like two hours after that. <laughs> and it was really, really weird how they went about that. Yeah, that's a shame. Seems yeah. like somebody. Uh, I, mean, I, I trust Apple. I mean, yeah. uh, as much as you can trust anybody. I think that, I mean, obviously their bottom line is profit, but. Uh, if iTunes hadn't happened, uh, I don't know where we'd be right now. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, a, that's so a, let's just let's just hope that they're doing it right. Yes, I, I believe that they are. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is I, I feel like for, again, for, you know, for the people that have, you know, have really gotten their name out there, it like these services, I mean, it's, 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 you know, getting rid of, of, of money for them, but at the same time it is getting their music out to more people. But I just feel like there mm. has to be something, there has to be something that needs to be done to, to help out people getting started. And I feel like it's, it, that really yeah. hasn't been discovered yet. 
No, that's a good one because labels used to make so much money from the huge artists that they were prepared to invest in startup bands and invest in bands that you know would they would take a chance and now they won't do that right. because there's so little money. Um, but you know why? You have to ask why. Why? Why does a new band need to be heard? You know, I don't know how it works. <laughs> I'm working with a new band, fairly new band. I'm sort of <laughs> I've fallen into the role of managing, oh, yeah. and I'm doing it as a total believe in them. And I think uh, that she's a star, and she needs to be heard. Nice. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, and I think if somebody is that good, if they carry a certain momentum with them. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems how many. Well, we will never know how many amazing. Or, talented or stars that never actually happened. We only right. hear about the ones that yeah. But I do feel that people that you know are gonna make it carry a momentum and they uh, they break through things. Yeah. Well, and now I, I wanted to ask, now I wanted to move on here. I wanted to talk about resus, resources for a minute now, because we are in that technology age. I mean, we've pretty much been discussing this for a while. You know, um, what are some, you know, internet sites or books that you've read that you really recommend anyone in this line of work should at least know about these? Uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> what books? Does it, nobody reads books anymore, do they? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is funny information. I just search. I just Google search. Okay. Like if I'm working on something and I need to know how to do something, I just Google. Google. It. Where would we be? Uh, like, I, I, I just love that Google is like a collection of li- what we used to have to go to the library for. I love <laughs> Google. Like, I don't know where you would be without Google nowadays. Why is that? that? Well, you know, my absolute favorite thing about Google, though, that I find so hilarious is the fact that Google can tell you anything. Google can can like like if you're confused about anything, go on Google. But no one does that. Like, I mean, and it's so funny, the things that people post like recently, someone was was posting on my wall, my wall on Facebook about something. And it was just absolutely absurd. And I, I went on and they were like, like have you heard about this? This is ridiculous. And they're like messaging like all their friends. And I went on, on Google and it took me two seconds to find out what it was fake. <laughs> and I'm like, it literally took me two seconds and the person still didn't believe me. And I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. There, there's no hope for you then. <laughs> I mean, we have, you know, we've all got the encyclopedia Britannica times a million at our fingertips all oh, the time. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if I I need anything, anything happens like in my studio or anything, my car, my bicycle, you just Google it and you get answers from like 20,000 people right. and you have to sit through it, but you know, it's all there. Exactly. I mean, you know, every, um, every gear manufacturer has got their own forums. So yeah, it's, it's a very fluid and um, instant thing. But have you Googled yourself? That's the real question. <laughs> Occasionally, see, what's, see what nonsense has been said about <laughs> Well, you, you know what's actually funny about this is this is something that I, I feel like people go, oh, that's so narcissistic to look yourself up. But I feel like as artists, we kind of have to because we kind of need to know what, like when you search your name, what is actually showing up? Because if bad stuff is showing up right away, you kind of need to fix that. <laughs> also because that, those are like, yeah. the, that's how you are represented these days. This is what people are going to be looking up yeah, first. Yeah. So you kind of like, as much as it sucks, either you or somebody else has to figure <laughs> these things out for you. True. I think it, it, it's interesting. It's super interesting to see that. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we are getting down to the end of our interview. But before we go, where are places that our listeners can find out more about you and this m- new music you've got, you know, going on? Uh, well, yeah, there is stuff on my website, which is rogeroadonald.com, and on my Facebook page, which is Roger O'Donnell Music, and uh, Twitter, I think that's one of my real name. So, yeah, there's there's lots of resources on my, uh, web, on my uh, website, and I talk more in depth about the process. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I, I just had a final question because it's the album is called Love and Other Tragedies. Do you feel love is a tragedy? <laughs> Absolutely, especially right now. Ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, definitely a tragedy. 
Well, thank you so much, Roger, for being on the show. It's really been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, nice to see you guys. Thank you. And enjoy uh, a year in Reykjavik or? Yes. Yeah. I might be coming in uh, July for a friend's birthday. Oh, Oh, excellent. Maybe see you. Yeah, we'll have to meet up. I know know Iceland very well. My ex is Icelandic. Yes, Elizabeth, (laughs) right? Uh, Elizabeth. Yes, exactly. You know, I was a... I was dancing with uh, her brother. Oh yeah, right, yeah. right, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. And for more information on Roger and the podcast, go to entertainmentdrivethrough.com and subscribe on iTunes. Like and follow us on our Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainment drive through and our Twitter and Instagram at eDriveThru. Hi, this is Roger O'Donnell, and you've been listening to Entertainment Drive Through.